Good evening, and welcome to the Zionist Organization of America 2021 Virtual Superstar Gala. Tonight we'll start off with ZOA National President Mort Klein, who will deliver the Dr. Bob Schulman Lecture after being introduced by none other than Dr. Bob himself. Later, awards will be presented to the distinguished honorees, Prime Minister of Israel Naftali Bennett and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. You'll hear from philanthropist Dr. Miriam Adelson, as well as newly elected National Board Chairman and renowned civil rights lawyer David Schoen. You'll also get a closer look at ZOA's work over the last year through the eyes and hearts of lay leaders from across the country. From Florida, you'll meet Donnie Oppenheimer. From Pittsburgh, Judy Cobell and Ira Frank. From Philadelphia, Dr. Ronald Warren and his wife, Dr. Marguerite Warren of blessed memory. Ruth and Morton Gleit, Dr. Charles Greenberg, and Drs. Harris and Phoebe Mainster from Michigan. Together, we'll honor community activists Ruben Margulis and Gloria Cayley for their tireless work on behalf of the Jewish and pro-Israel communities. We'll also welcome Yaakov Hagoel, chairman of the World Zionist Organization, and Mr. Henry Schwartz, an integral supporter of the ZOA and the State of Israel. And I'm your host, Lisa Daftari. From my work as a political analyst and news commentator, as well as a podcast host and a loud advocate against a nuclear Iran, I have gotten to know the ZOA quite well. In fact, we work together on a campaign to show the dangers of a nuclear Iran and to promote our firm stance against a nuclear holocaust. As someone of Iranian descent, I know that most people of Iran, and really from that region, want to be free from extremist terrorist rulers, and I applaud the ZOA for standing publicly and proudly on this issue. And that is why I love the ZOA, because it's bold, brave, and virtuous, and because it's committed to fighting for truth. And I'm sure that's why you're here tonight, too. But first, it's my distinct honor to welcome Dr. Bob Shilman, a ZOA National Board Vice President and former Louis D. Brandeis Award honoree, as well as an integral supporter of this organization. Good evening. I'm Dr. Bob Shulman. A few weeks ago, when Mort asked me if I would introduce him this evening, I, of course, responded yes but I wondered why he would need to be introduced to an audience of supporters who already know who he is. After all, he's been president of ZOA for the past 28 years. So if you are in this audience and you don't know who he is, you've signed up for the wrong meeting. But even though you know who Mort is, you probably don't know everything there is to know about him. In the next 45 minutes, I'm going to fill in those gaps. Uh, wait a minute. A message just popped up on my screen, and I've just learned that uh, we're using the free version of this software, which limits my time to about five minutes. So I'll summarize my remarks. 74 years ago, Mort Klein was born to Holocaust survivors in a displaced persons camp in Germany. When he was four, he and his family emigrated from Germany to South Philadelphia in the United States, where he grew up. He has accomplished a lot in those 74 years. His resume is filled with accomplishments, including being a member of the faculty at Temple University, where he lectured in mathematics and statistics, being a senior biostatistician at the UCLA School of Public Health, and performing research with Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling in Palo Alto, California. In addition, he has served as an economic advisor to three presidents. Many accomplishments, but the thing that he will be most remembered for is his courage and outspokenness on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people at ZOA. Here's how that transformation came about from being an academician to becoming a Jewish warrior. In 1993, Mott was president of the Philadelphia chapter of the ZOA, and he became dismayed and upset over the recent signing of the Oslo Accords, which he then recognized was a disastrous mistake for Israel. Seeking a larger platform to voice his views, he ran for and was elected president of the national organization. 
He has been president and chief spokesperson of ZOA since that date for the past 28 years. And in that time, he has transformed ZOA from a moribund group to a high profile, outspoken organization that is known for taking on any and all groups that challenge the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state. Mort is unafraid and relentless in calling out individuals for their blatant anti-Semitism and defamation of Israel. Even elected officials such as Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib or popular organizations such as Black Lives Matter do not deter him, and they are frequent targets of his exceptionally well-written letters and reports. He is not afraid of the vile accusations that are often leveled against him, some even from the old line Jewish organizations that purport to support Israel, such as ADL. The fact that he is an unwavering supporter of Israel in the face of such criticism, the fact that he doesn't stand down, is exactly why he continues to be the leader of this organization. I can't think of a more qualified individual to give the Dr. Bob Shulman lecture on the topic of Islamic war against the Jews than my friend, your president, Mort Klein. I welcome all of our dear friends and fellow Zionists from all over America and all over the world. Thank you for being here with us for this very special ZOA gala together with our dear friends and honorees, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, renowned physician and philanthropist Dr. Miriam Adelson, honorees Ruben Margulis, Gloria Cayley, as well as Dr. Bob Shulman, Lisa Daftari, David Schoen, and so many others. Ever since the Zionist Organization of America was founded 124 years ago, the ZOA has been the leader in working for recognition of the Jewish people's rights to our homeland, Eretz Yisrael, and our eternal capital, Yerushalayim, and to protect the safety and security of Israel and the Jewish people, and to combat anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, some of our people's achievements and ZOA's efforts to bring about these advances have sometimes been reversed when governments or administrations backtracked or denied the Jewish people's hard-won rights. Thus, after binding international legal agreements and treaties were enacted in the 1920s, enshrining the Jewish people's rights to immigrate, to resettle, and reconstitute the Jewish homeland, Britain turned around and illegally slammed shut the doors to Israel just at the moment when millions of Jews faced annihilation in Europe. In recent times, during the previous friendly administration, we had tremendous pro-Israel advances on issues that ZOA long fought for and continued to fight for. The Trump administration recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, relocated the embassy there, recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan, and recognized that settlements, the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, are legal. The previous administration also ended the catastrophic Iran deal, which promoted a pathway to Iranian nuclear weapons, carried out a maximum sanctions pressure campaign that limited Iran's funding of terrorism and consistently supported Israel at the United Nations. They also imposed sanctions penalizing the International Criminal Court's lawless, phony war crimes investigations of Israel. They stopped funding the Palestinian Authority, which of course is a terrorist dictatorship, and they continue to pay Arabs to murder Jews and Americans. They stopped funding UNRWA, which teaches Arab children to aspire to kill Jews and hides rockets for Hamas and they issued an executive order making real efforts to curb campus anti-Semitism. But we are now facing an administration that is moving to backtrack on some of these very important advances. We're at a critical moment when Israel and her leaders and all of us who love Israel must stand strong against what this administration is trying to do. The Biden administration is attempting to re-enter the catastrophic Iran deal, undermine Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem and the Golan, and deny the Jewish people's right to live and build in the Jewish heartlands of Judea and Samaria, while allowing the Palestinian Arabs to build there. The Biden administration also failed to oppose a recent dangerous anti-Israel UN resolution. They resumed funding the Palestinians and UNRWA. They lifted the ICC sanctions and is failing to effectively address or even cite and condemn the anti-Semitism coming from the squad and other Jew haters in Congress and from radical Muslim and left-wing groups on college campuses and in our cities. 
It's fitting for us to first discuss Jerusalem, the eternal capital and holy city of the Jewish people. <laughs> when the Babylonians destroyed the first temple in Jerusalem and exiled much of Jerusalem's Jewish population, the Jewish people prayed, if I forget the O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. And if I remember thee not, if I set not Jerusalem above my chiefest joy. For 2,000 years since the destru destruction of the second temple, Jews have continued to pray towards Jerusalem every day. Remember the temple's destruction during our weddings. And exclaim, B'Shana Haba'a B'Rushalayim, next year in Jerusalem on our holidays. Our holy book, the Torah, mentions Jerusalem 700 times. By contrast, Jerusalem is not holy to Muslims. Muslims pray toward Mecca, not Jerusalem, and never mention Jerusalem in their holy book, the Koran. For centuries after Muhammad lived, Muslims claimed that Muhammad in a dream was transported to a mosque in Jerusalem one night while he was simply dreaming. But there was no mosque in Jerusalem, so he could not have been going to Jerusalem to a mosque there. And no Arab leader except King Hussein ever visited Jerusalem when the Arabs controlled it from 1948 to 1967. And we must always remember the majority of people living in Jerusalem since the first census in 1840 were Jewish people. Few people realize that. In the 1990s ZOA, and together with our friends in Congress, we led the fight for the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995. For a while, we were the only organization f fighting for that act. This act recognized Jerusalem as Israel's reunited, undivided capital and called for the U.S. Embassy to be moved to Jerusalem. Congress adopted the Jerusalem Embassy Act almost unanimously. Unfortunately, the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations still failed to move the embassy as the act required. I personally testified in congressional hearings and continued to push for the embassy to be relocated until the Trump administration finally did this in May of 2018. Back in 1995, when he was a U.S. Senator, President Biden supported this Jerusalem Embassy Act and eloquently spoke up for the Jewish people's rights to Jerusalem. I'll read you what Senator Biden said, reported in the congressional record. It may surprise you in light of what his administration is doing today. Senator Biden said, and I quote, those familiar with the Jewish people know the central meaning that the ancient city of Jerusalem has for Jews everywhere. Time and again, empires have tried to sever the umbilical cord that unites Jews with their capital. They have destroyed the temple. They have banished the Jews from living in Jerusalem. They have limited the number of Jews allowed to immigrate to that city. And finally, in this century, they tried simply to eliminate all the Jews. They may have succeeded in destroying physical structures and lives, but they have never succeeded in wholly eliminating the Jewish presence in Jerusalem or in cutting the spiritual bond between Jews and their cherished capital. After the horrific events of the Holocaust, the Jewish people returned to claim what many rulers have tried to deny them for centuries, the right to peaceful existence in their own country, in their own capital. How many of us, said Biden, can forget that poignant forward photograph of an unnamed Israeli soldier breaking down in tears and praying as he reached the Western Wall after his army liberated the eastern half of the city in the Six-Day War? Those tears told a story a story of a people long denied their rightful place among nations, a people denied access to their most hallowed religious sites, a people who would finally, after long tribulation, come home. And as Biden then emphasized, the only way there will be peace in the Middle East is for Arabs to know there is no division whatsoever between the United States and Israel. None, zero, none, unquote, said Senator Joe Biden. But now... <laughs> The Biden administration is pushing to open a consulate for Palestinian Arabs in the heart of Jerusalem, in Western Jerusalem. Such a consulate would undermine Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem. It violates the Jerusalem Embassy Act, will likely result in violating the Oslo Accords, which prohibit the Palestinian Authority from engaging in foreign relations. The consulate is a diplomatic insult and danger to Israel and the Jewish people. Such a consulate for Palestinian Arabs would send a terrible message that Jerusalem doesn't really belong to Israel. The consulate would promote making Jerusalem the capital of an Iranian proxy Palestinian Arab terrorist state and promote dividing Israel's eternal capital. The consulate would also reward and encourage the fascist terrorist dictatorship of the Palestinian Authority, which is simply a terrorist regime, by their continuing to pay Arabs to murder Jews and continue to incite hatred against Jews. The Palestinian Authority terrorist dictator, Mahmoud Abbas, continues telling Muslims to spill their blood to stop Jews and Christians' filthy feet, says Abbas, from defiling Jerusalem, from defiling the Temple Mount, from defiling the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Why is this 
horrific actions being rewarded. Under the Vienna Convention on Consular Affairs, the U.S. cannot legally open such a consulate without Israel's permission. It would be against international law. But the Biden administration has been trying to twist Israel's arms to obtain such permission. In August, President Biden pushed for opening such a consulate during his summit meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in Washington. The Biden administration is exerting pressure on Israel every week on this issue. COA is pushing back on this important issue. We at COA place giant banners on the front of tall major buildings in Israel, in Jerusalem, stating no to the consulate, with pictures of the Kotel on the Western Wall. We at ZOA are speaking with government officials. We've sent out action alerts to our activists, held seminars, published op-eds, spoke out on TV and radio, and urged other Jewish groups to join our efforts. But no Jewish group has, I'm sorry to say, it pains me to say, not APAC, not AJ Committee, not the ADL, not the Conference of Presidents, and not any of the other major groups have done so. We must urge them to do so, to support the Israeli government. When the Israeli Interior Minister Ayala Chaked visited the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations a few weeks ago, I personally asked her whether it would be important for American Jewish groups to speak out publicly against opening the consulate in Jerusalem. Chaked strongly agreed and said Jewish groups must speak out publicly. She also clearly explained that Israel's leadership, including Gidon Saar, Yair Lapid, Prime Minister Bennett, and the Israeli people are all firmly opposed to opening the consulate. I'd like to ask everyone here, who's also connected to other organizations, to ask those organizations, to ask your rabbis, to join the ZOA in speaking out publicly against opening up this Palestinian Arab consulate in Yerushalayim. The Jewish people's right to build and live in, Judea, in Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria so-called settlements is another issue the Biden administration is attempting to unravel. Judea and Samaria have been centers of Jewish life for thousands of years. Abraham and Sarah are buried here in Hebron. The Maccabees had their base here in Beit El. We are called Jews because we are from Judea. Jew is a contraction of the word Judea. And today, approximately 500,000 Jews live in Judea and Samaria. The 1922 mandate and surrounding binding international agreements and treaties, including treaties to which the United States is a party, guaranteed the Jewish people's rights to settle and live and build in Judea and Samaria. In 2019, I'm proud to tell you that Secretary Pompeo publicly supported and acknowledged the Jewish people's legal, religious, historical, and political rights to live and build in Judea and Samaria. Former President Trump's peace plan also acknowledged that Judea and Samaria is a territory to which Israel has asserted valid legal and historical claims, which are part of the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. Thank you, President Trump. Secretary Pompeo also reinforced the legality of these communities by himself visiting the Pisagot winery in Ben Yomim, Israel, in the Judean hills near Jerusalem. I understand the winery actually named one of its wines Pisagot Pompeo in his honor and appreciation. But now the Biden administration is undermining the Jewish people's rights in Judea and Samaria. At the Biden-Bennett meeting in Washington in August, Biden also demanded Israel should exercise restraint regarding building and settlements in Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem. But no restraint was requested on the Palestinians' building. It wasn't demanded at all by Biden. And their building goes on at 10 times the rate of Israeli building. Biden's demand that only Jews must curtail building homes in Jewish homelands, while Palestinian Arabs can build as they please, is blatant anti-Semitic discrimination, which would be illegal under numerous U.S. laws, including Florida's and New York's housing discrimination and human rights laws. Jewish building freezes and restraints only whet Palestinian Arab leaders' appetites for more unilateral Israeli concessions, thereby hindering the possibility of peace. In November 2009, under pressure from the Obama-Biden administration, former Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu agreed to a 10-month building freeze. The freeze was supposed to jumpstart Israeli PA negotiations. Instead, PLO dictator Mahmoud Abbas refused to meet, and he hasn't negotiated for 12 years. Over 2,400 Israeli security and military professionals also explained that Israeli sovereignty and control over Judea and Samaria is essential for is securing Israel's defense. Another challenge is the Biden administration's efforts to reinstate the catastrophic Iran deal. In 2015, ZOA helped organize massive protests in Washington and elsewhere against the Iran deal, 
We pointed out the deal's fatal flaws. The deal lacks anywhere, anytime inspections. It prohibits inspectors from entering Iran's military facilities, which are likely used as places to promote the development of nuclear weapons. It has early and uh, sunset clauses. It lacks military restrictions. It allows Iran to continue running over 5,000 centrifuges and develop advanced centrifuges. And gave Iran, this deal gave Iran $150 billion, which Iran has used to increase its terror operations throughout the Middle East and elsewhere. It didn't make them moderate, as President Obama proclaimed. <laughs> the deal's temporary restrictions on Iran's nuclear program are easily reversible. Side deals uncovered by then Congressman Pompeo and Senator Cotton absurdly enabled Iran to collect its own samples to inspect. After the Iran deal went into effect, ZOA pointed out Iran's violations of the deal and urged its rescission. The treasure trove of documents that Israel's daring agents seized from a warehouse in Tehran in 2018 proved that Iran's nuclear weaponization program was far more extensive than anyone previously thought. The Trump administration finally ended U.S. participation in the deal and imposed sanctions that effectively reduced Iran's ability to fund its terror proxies around the world. The Biden administration's efforts to re-enter the, uh, the Iran deal are truly idiotic and extremely dangerous. The efforts to war Iran, such as turning a blind eye to Iran's sales of oil to China, are enabling Iran to fund its terror and military, military operations. We must continue to work against this. The final challenge I'll discuss is the growing scourge of anti-Semitism. ZOA praised President Biden for his inspiring words on the recent anniversary of the massacre of 11 innocent Jews at the synagogue called the Tree of Life. Biden stated, quote, if we give hate oxygen, it can consume. And we must always stand up and speak out against anti-Semitism with clarity and conviction and rally against the forces of hate in all its forms, because silence is complicity, said Biden so appropriately. But then we're compelled to ask the president, why has neither he nor the Democratic Party or leaders like Speaker Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, Jim Kleiman, Chuck Schumer, why have they not implemented Biden's own important words by speaking out and condemning the anti-Semites in Congress? Why do they remain silent? Anti-Semitism is being given vast amounts of oxygen today by a frighteningly growing number of Jew-hating and Israel-hating members of Congress, including Ilan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, AOC, Betty McCollum, Mark Pocan, Cory Bush, Jamal Bowman, and others who promote legislation against the Jewish state of Israel, falsely accuse the Jewish state and her Jewish citizens of blood libels, and accuse American Jews of disloyalty and buying Congress. Most of these Jew-haters in Congress publicly support boycotting Israel, falsely call Israel evil and a racist apartheid state, which practices ethnic cleansing against Palestinian Arabs. What rubbish! Some even justify Arab murderous riots and openly honor Jew killers and stand next to uh, Jew killers who have escaped and praise them. <laughs> Horrifyingly, instead of condemning such Congress members' anti-Semitism, on May 18, 2021, while Israel is being bombarded with over 4,400 Hamas rockets, <laughs> President Biden shockingly strongly praised the Jew hater Representative Rashida Tlaib, who opposes Israel's very existence. Shortly after Tlaib again promoted boycotting Israel and called Israel an apartheid state, Biden disgracefully said to Rashida Tlaib, quote, said Biden, I admire your intellect. I admire your passion. I admire your concern for so many other people. You're a fighter, Rashida Tlaib, and God thank you for being a fighter. What a disgraceful episode in Biden's administration. And after a student falsely accused the Jewish state of Israel of committing ethnic genocide, an insane lie, Vice President Kamala Harris failed to challenge the student against this ugly, phony blood libel and said supported it. She said, quote, your voice, your perspective, your experience, your truth cannot be suppressed and it must be heard. In addition, numerous Biden appointees have lengthy anti-Semitic and Israel bashing records. This is so alarming and so extensive that ZOA established a Biden Appointments Watch webpage documenting the records of the 20 hostile to Israel officials that Biden has appointed. Just for a few examples, Hedy Amar, who's the Deputy Secretary for Israel-Palestinian Affairs, 
said he was inspired by the terrorist Palestinian Intifada. Maher Bittar, the intelligence director for the National Security Council, ran an, an annual program called How to Demonize Israel. And Navriel Haynes, the national intelligence director, falsely condemned Israel's violence, terrorism, and incitement. All lies. People often take their cues from the country's leaders. <laughs> we are deeply concerned that this country's leaders' failures to speak out and take action against the anti-Semites in Congress, the anti-Semitic appointments, is helping to inspire hatred of and attacks on innocent Jews in Brooklyn, Muncie, Jersey City, LA, and elsewhere. <laughs> I also believe that propaganda lies against Israel is a significant factor in the surge in anti-Semitism. Israeli leaders and Jewish leaders and rabbis and pro-Israel Christians must fight against these lies by proclaiming the truth. The truth that Jerusalem is not really holy to Muslims, that the Koran never mentions Jerusalem, and no Arab leader but King Hussein ever visited Jerusalem, or that the Arabs never even made it their capital when the Arabs controlled it. We must all proclaim the truth that settlements comprise only 3% of the entire West Bank and proclaim that there is no occupation. Another lie, the Palestinian Arabs control all of Gaza, 40% of Judea and Samaria. That's where 99% of all the Palestinians live under the rule of the Palestinian Authority, who run everything in their lives except sharing security with Israel. And we must all proclaim the truth about the so-called Palestinian state solution. We must proclaim that the Palestinians were offered a state six times in the last 85 years, four times in the last 20 years, only to be rejected by the Arabs every single time. Why? Because these offers required that the Arabs accept Israel as a Jewish state. They wouldn't do it. It required that they end their demand that millions of Arabs be permitted to move into Israel, destroying Israel as a Jewish state. They wouldn't do it. And agreeing to ending all further claims. And they wouldn't do it. Although we face many challenges today, I urge you to not be discouraged. The fact that thousands of us are gathered here at this virtual gala shows that so many of us, so, such huge number of us, do care. We will continue to be strong. And with the help of Almighty God, and with the help of the Jewish Zionists and Evangelical Christian Zionists, and the remarkable Israeli people, we will overcome all of these serious but temporary obstacles, and will ultimately strengthen U.S.-Israel relations, and promote the truth of the Arab Islamist war against Israel in the West, and will finally implement the moral, principled, wise policies that will strengthen and benefit both Israel and America. Thank you all. May God bless you all. God bless America and Eretz Yisrael. For 124 years, the Zionist Organization of America has stood firm as the Jewish people's most reliable ally and protector. ZOA led the fight in the U.S. to re-establish the Jewish state five generations ago. In the 20th century, it stood by Israel as the young country matured into a leading nation on the world stage despite all odds. Today, under the 28-year stewardship of Morton Klein, ZOA flourishes as a nonpartisan advocate for a strong U.S.-Israel alliance, Israel's unequivocal right to defend herself, and dismantling policies that threaten Israel's safety and Jewish life. Anti-Israel rhetoric and overt anti-Semitic attacks have risen to alarming levels. On college campuses, on social media, in corporate boardrooms, and even halls of government, open malice toward the state of Israel has become the new normal. The winds of change demand ZOA's unflinching support for the Jewish state now more than ever before. ZOA brings the fight for Israel to four main arenas, media and education, government advocacy, student support, and law and justice. The message about Zionism and anti-Israel bias has been clear and consistent for decades. Promote the truth about Israel's right to its land, its claim to Jerusalem, and the morality of its actions in the face of violent threats. Among its nonpartisan positions, ZOA has long held that an undivided Jerusalem and Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria, is just, and that a two-state solution would create a substantial terrorist threat. Media appearances, leadership programs, events, and educational initiatives organized by the ZOA influence the global community toward greater appreciation for the modern state of Israel and its accomplishments. ZOA has earned the unparalleled trust of high-ranking officials in both the U.S. and Israeli governments through years of relationship building. Full-time ZOA professionals meet with senators and congressmen to lobby for the issues that are important to both countries. 
Notably, ZOA publicly opposed the Oslo Accords, Gaza withdrawal, and Iran deal, while pushing for the U.S. Embassy's move to Jerusalem and recognition of Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. ZOA officials routinely testify before Congress on key issues such as anti-BDS legislation and run awareness campaigns to support the appointment of pro-Israel officials and combat those hostile to Israel. Over 100 campuses across the country are served by ZOA community building events, speaker series, mentoring groups, educational programs, seminars, and student trips to Israel. In an effort to promote healthy discourse around Zionism and Israel, ZOA President Morton Klein has personally traveled to a number of major universities for speaking engagements to tell the truth about Israel and encourage thoughtful debate among Jewish and non-Jewish students. By training the next generation to effectively advocate for Israel and refute the anti-Zionist propaganda flooding campuses, ZOA works to ensure that students feel safe and proud to express their Jewish identity and Zionism at college. In 2002, ZOA established the Center for Law and Justice to defend Israel in the courts, litigating the most complex lawsuits on behalf of Jewish students, terror victims, Jerusalem's legal status, and other cases with ripple effects for Israeli citizens and Jews across the world. ZOA led the groundbreaking fight to reinterpret Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to protect Jewish students against discrimination has filed numerous amicus briefs with the Supreme Court to clarify anti-Jewish policies, and fought for Israel to be listed as the birthplace on U.S. passports for citizens born in Jerusalem. The Zionist Organization of America's founders dreamt of peace and dignity for the Jewish people in their rightful homeland. 124 years later, ZOA is stronger than ever, but the fight for Israel's future is still on, and we're not slowing down anytime soon. Wow, that video says it all. The Zionist Organization of America is at the forefront of all battles concerning Israel and the Jewish people for one clear reason. The ZOA is not afraid to fight for truth. And let me tell you, there's no one else I want leading these battles other than Mort Klein and the ZOA. That is why it's an honor for me to tell you that a ZOA supporter so inspired by the work of the organization has generously agreed to match the next $75,000 that comes in. So please, take out your phone and text the word DONATE to 929-930-5405. That's D-O-N-A-T-E to 929-930-5405 and give a gift today that will provide double the support. But enough from me. Let's hear from people all across the country who love and support the message and hard work of the ZOA. When I moved to Pittsburgh, it's almost 30 years ago, I went to one of the ZOA honorary dinners. And then it was explained to me and discussed on how important it was for ZOA and what they do for Israel. And that drew me in. I became involved with the ZOA um, about 20 years ago. I joined ZOA because they were the most proactive and, and busy organization around. So I got involved with ZOA Pittsburgh many years ago when I was asked to chaperone a busload of high school students to the Washington, D.C. Holocaust Museum. My involvement started with a pro-Israel rally that I organized on 15th Street every Friday at noon to combat a group that was protesting Israel's very existence. Many organizations kind of got in line and, and threw their support behind the Iran deal that was being put forward. And very few organizations stood up and said, no, this is not good for Israel. And as a result, we can't get behind it. And when it came down to it, ZOA was one of the only organizations that stood up, drew the line and said, no, this is too far. I knew at that point I needed to join ZOA and what it stood for. Israel today and always has meant the national homeland of the Jewish people, where they can be as safe as possible. It's a fulfillment of the historical right of the Jewish people to live in the land of Israel 
and to be free and happy there. Making sure that it continues in perpetuity to be the homeland. I grew up knowing people that had bags packed and passports ready. God forbid something happened in this country long before we thought it would, that they would have to flee and have a place to go where they felt safe. ZOA stands for the proposition that whatever is in Israel's best interests is what we're going to push. ZOA stands out in its uh, undying love and support of Israel far more than any other organization. And ZOA presents a very clear picture of what's important for its support of both Israel and support of Jews who support Israel. Unfortunately, many of the current Jewish organizations cower to the general climate of opinion, which states that Israel is not a particularly special state. It doesn't have the standing of some of the other nations of the world, in spite of all the history that the Jewish people have gone through. Uh, the ZOA has never put up with any of this nonsense. Mort Klein has been very steadfast in stating that the Jewish people have every right to the land of Israel and that there's so many other nations in the world, only one Jewish nation. And therefore, we have to have this particular small plot of land in our hands. The ZOA does not shirk from its core mission. ZOA knows what is right and will not be deterred or swayed, and the ZOA will continue, come what may. In this era of so much misinformation, young people are really the lifeline into the, into the truth of the future. And if you are a young person and you want your world to represent something better than what it is right now, you have to reach out and do something about it. When I was in law school, um, I was the executive vice president of the Cardoza Legal Society, which was the Jewish uh, Society for Campus Life uh, at the University of Miami. And uh, one day when I was coming to school, I saw there were flyers up around the school uh, posted by the Students for Justice of Palestine, the SJP, uh, with depictions of the IDF soldiers with swastikas, killing babies, and other terrible, terrible images around campus, and I tore them down. I was actually brought in front of the Dean of Students and the student government um, who said that I was defacing school property and they were going to have a rally there and whether I like it or not, it's going to happen. And the school that would identified at 47% self-identified as Jewish, no one else did anything. It was just me. And I sat in a room with Dean of Students and the SJP while they yelled at me and screamed at me about how I was doing terrible things and that they were allowed their First Amendment rights and they were going to do this. So I unrolled one of the posters that I tore down and handed it across the table to the Dean of Students, who looked at it, recoiled in disgust and said, you put this up? And they were silent. And I thought that that moment that if it weren't for me, just one person who would have gone on unmolested, unchecked, unchallenged, and that kids who didn't know any better would be hearing a one-sided hate-filled message full of anti-Semitism and racism and accepted as gospel truth. It can't happen. We have to stand up for what's important, what's right, and what's just. ZOA has always stood up for the truth. They fight for the truth. They educate for the truth. To every young person, the message is the same. Jews have to be supportive of Israel. We need to make it strong. And I think that it deserves all of our attention and all of our support. I think people have to look within their heart and see where is the effort being put forward on the behalf of Israel? Where is there a lot of foolishness and where is there a lot of solid support? And the ZOA represents the solid support. The state of Israel stands for as the only democracy in the Middle East that guarantees rights and freedoms to everyone. It stands for our future, for our ability to find somewhere to go, a safe haven, that for so many didn't exist when they needed it most. And we need it today, and we certainly need it tomorrow. And our job today is to stand up, because if we don't, and we keep our head down and just walk right by, it may not be there. I'd like to see a world that has a 
a mutual respect for the Jewish people and for the Jewishness and for the state of Israel. It's important for my children and my grandchildren. We have four grandchildren. And those grandchildren are growing up. And they're going to grow up into a world that we hope will be better. The Jewish people have always needed protection. However, I think that we have to live by the phrase that we have used in modern times, never again, and we have to mean it. We got involved 50 years ago. We were Zionists. We believed in Israel. We lived through Israel's formation through the 45 and 48 when they became a state. ZOA supported it. We support ZOA. We're Zionists. We believe in Israel. It is a great honor for us to accept the Zionist in the Spotlight Award. And we feel honored and very privileged to be a part of the Michigan chapter. And we thank you for it, recognizing our contribution and our part of being this in this community. I proudly share the pleasure with the other honorees this evening, knowing that good work has been done in our name. Tonight, I am honored to accept the Zionist in the Spotlight Award on behalf of ZOA in Michigan. It is an absolute honor to accept this award as the Zionist in the Spotlight on behalf of myself and the rest of the Florida ZOA board. Thank you to the Pittsburgh ZOA chapter for nominating me and um, having me be the Zionist in the Spotlight representing Pittsburgh along with my good friend and colleague, Judy, I want to congratulate all of those who are honored at this time, and frankly, some of the past honorees who I know so well. I'm very privileged to be here, and I thank you all for this great honor. And I give a hearty mazel tov to all the honorees from other cities, the national honorees, all of the guests and dignitaries that are joining with us today, and keep fighting and keep up the hard work. And of course, we want to thank all the other honorees for the wonderful work they have done and will continue to do in honor of Israel, the ZOA, the Jewish people. There are many ways to become more involved with the Zionist Organization of America, and just one is through their expertly curated missions. During a typical year, the ZOA invites supporters to join its annual advocacy mission to Capitol Hill and a once-in-a-lifetime trip to Israel. Take a look. If you're interested in joining, text the word TRIP, T-R-I-P, to the following number, 929-930-5405. The Zionist Organization of America is proud to serve as the bold, unapologetic voice for Israel and Jews around the world. As part of that responsibility, ZOA empowers constituents to use their own voices to advocate for their rightful homeland. Today, anti-Israel propaganda is at an all-time high, corrupting the culture on college campuses around the country and maligning the Jewish state in the mainstream media where one-sided narratives are often accepted as truth. Even members of Congress speak openly against Israel, pressuring traditional supporters and emerging Zionists to soften their pro-Israel stances. To set the record straight, ZOA has welcomed thousands of students and adults to participate in unique leadership missions to Israel and advocacy missions to Capitol Hill. Twice each year, ZOA offers a first-hand experience of what life in the Jewish state is really like, not for tourists or visitors, but for Israelis. Every trip offers relationship-building opportunities with high-level Israeli officials that allow American Jews to see Israel through the eyes of its leaders. And in order to show participants what the media won't, ZOA is the only organization to bring its trips into Judea and Samaria and to towns where Jews and Arabs live together. What sets ZOA's mission apart is the approach that even as American Jews, we live here. All of Israel is home to all of the Jewish people. No areas are off limits. Trips are heavily secured and expertly guided, planned in conjunction with the ZOA Israel office to provide the educational and spiritual experience of a lifetime. 
ZOA recognizes that building a stronger relationship between the U.S. and Israel demands that Israel's advocates go straight to the seat of power on Capitol Hill. Each year, ZOA's Washington Advocacy Mission facilitates face-to-face -face meetings with congressmen, senators, and D.C. power brokers for delegations of students and adults from across the country. With this unprecedented access, Israel supporters express their concerns directly and show their elected officials the true face of the pro-Israel community. In addition, participants hear influential lawmakers give speeches highlighting key issues confronting Israel and the United States. Beyond meeting with their representatives, ZOA educates its delegates on how to effectively lobby for Israel. ZOA's missions to Israel and Washington reinforce each other to create a uniquely impactful advocacy strategy. Armed with first-hand experiences from their homeland, ZOA ambassadors are empowered to approach Capitol Hill with a sense of ownership over Israeli affairs. These missions provide a journey that really changes people. ZOA doesn't only give Israel supporters a voice, it gives them a critical role in the greatest story of our time. Wow. After seeing that incredible and impressive video, following the remarks from the one-of-a-kind Mort Klein, I'm reminded of what a pleasure and privilege it is to serve as the chair of the Board of Directors of the Zionist Organization of America. For those of you I have not yet gotten to meet, my name is David Schoen, and it's a real honor to meet you on such a remarkable occasion. Tonight we celebrate an organization that is dedicated to fighting for truth, an organization that is brave and bold, and an organization that is determined to share and promote facts. Serving alongside our fearless leader, Mort Klein, inspires me, and I look forward to a successful tenure. As we look around the world at the end of 2021, we see increasing anti-Semitism both in the United States and abroad, including violent attacks on college campuses and synagogues across the country, and a harsh anti-Israel climate on Capitol Hill. Israel bashing has become the norm, as few are willing to stand against the current in order to shut down the lies. But the ZOA is. The ZOA is the only organization that is unafraid of a fight to expose and promote the truth, even when that means fighting alone. But in reality, the ZOA is never really alone because we have all of you and your support is crucial as it enables the ZOA and its staff to fight injustice wherever it occurs and to stand up for our people and our homeland. Like the footage you just saw of the ZOA's Capitol Hill advocacy mission and its mission to Israel, we are stronger in accomplishing our goals when we are together as a community. And that is why we need your continued partnership. So please take out your phone and text the word donate, D-O-N-A-T-E, to the number on screen. In the last month alone, we've loudly protested the opening of a Palestinian consulate in Jerusalem including placing large visible banners on one of the city's busiest highways. We've continued our tireless efforts to prevent a nuclear Iran through efforts in the media, and with government leaders both in the White House and on Capitol Hill, we've openly praised the members of Congress who sent a letter to President Biden opposing the consulate. We have publicly called out political leaders for not denouncing the attacks of those who demonize Israel. We fought against the state of Texas, instructing teachers to teach opposing perspectives on the Holocaust. And we've stood up against President Biden's pressure on Israel to stop the building in Judea and Samaria. And that's just to name a few. But remember, we can't do it alone. Please show your support for the ZOA as we continue to fight for truth. Thank you. I am so honored and so proud to say that I'm a personal friend of a very special Jewish woman and a very special Jewish soul, Gloria Cayley. And I also knew her husband, Harvey Cayley, who was an extraordinary and brilliant and hugely successful man, yet always approachable as a high-tech entrepreneur. Harvey was known not only for his smarts, but for his loving and caring heart, and also for being singularly focused with insightful ideas on any topic. And last but not least, his very small ponytail. And as Gloria is fond of saying, he was quite a guy. <laughs> Gloria and Harvey's Jewish philanthropy was never ending. For decades, the Harvey and Gloria Kelly Foundation gave away millions every year. They gave to Jewish education, to institutions such as Yeshiva University, Yeshiva Hartora, 
Hebrew Academy of the Five Towns, Jewish Adult Education of Great Neck Synagogue. They gave to synagogues, to Chabad's, to Jewish federations. They gave to social services and healthcare in Israel and in America, and to the Allah Nega Foundation and to United Hatzalah. But they especially loved and supported Ohel Children's Home and Family Services and the fabulous Camp Kaley, where love of Torah values is a priority where regular children went to camp together with special needs children to better teach kids to understand people with disabilities. And of course, we deeply appreciate their magnificent support of the oldest pro-Israel organization in the United States, our own Zionist organization of America, the ZOA. Gloria Kelly is a fantastic Jewish woman with enormous positive energy, a constant smile on her face, and a gigantic loving heart. Her love of Israel, her love of Torah Judaism knows no bounds. Gloria was always incapable of saying no to any worthwhile Jewish cause. Her love of our people and our homeland, Eretz Yisrael, is only surpassed by her love of her own family. I sense all of these wonderful values every time I speak to Gloria. She was a full partner with her dear husband, Harvey, in all of his endeavors, all of their endeavors, from business to philanthropy, to helping Israel, to promoting Yiddishkeit. Gloria and Harvey also gave to the Jewish world a beautiful family, their children, Roberta, Alicia, and David, their grandchildren, Hudson, Lee, Liran, Shira, Adi, Yanni Gali, and Lavi. It is my distinct pleasure and distinct honor to present to Gloria Kelly, a great Jewish woman with a great heart and smarts, and a full partner in the Gloria and Harvey Kelly Foundation, ZOA's Mortimer Zuckerman Award for Outstanding Jewish Philanthropy. Hi, Mort. Hi, friends. You all know me a bit. I want you all to know that I am very proud to be honored by you and ZOA. My late husband, Harvey, and I want to thank you for the Mort Zuckerman Award for Outstanding Jewish Philanthropy. You do know I am very committed to Israel and Judaism. I do worry about both. I rest a little easier with you and ZOA behind us and in front of us. You say how it is loud and clear. I've known Mort for more than 20 years. He has never let anyone or anything come in the way of doing the right thing. They defend Israel and push the truth when all the lies are flooding the media and our government. We have big times ahead of us and anti-Semitism and anti-Israel lies. But I must say, with you and ZOA, there is hope for the future, and we must also invest in our children because they too are our future. Mort has said that Harvey was a wonderful man, kind, generous, extremely smart, and with a big and good heart. He was right. Just about every Shabbos, someone would remind me about some unsolicited or solicited remark that Harvey would give to people in our community. He was smart and he did care. Generally, there was a line to speak with him, but that made me very proud. I truly thank you and ZOA. You are both appreciated by our family. Please keep up the good work and we will be happy to continually support you and ZOA. And I hope the others will also contribute because every bit helps large and small. Thank you again. Kol Tov. Gloria, thank you. Your remarkable devotion to Israel and the Jewish people is inspiring. You are absolutely deserving of this award for outstanding Jewish philanthropy. We wish you continued success in all of your endeavors. And now, to introduce another person worthy of recognition, I welcome Yaakov Hagoel, Chairman of the World Zionist Organization and Acting Chairman of the Jewish Agency for Israel. Shalom lachem, mi Yerushalayim, ir abira nitzchit shel ha'am ha'yehudi. Mizeh karov le-125 shana, ה-ZOA עומד בחזית העשייה הציונית, בעולם בכלל ובארצות הברית בפרט. כלל האנשים המכובדים החברים ב-ZOA הם אנשי עשייה, בעלי חזון והגשמה, שמקדישים את מרצם וזמנם למען עם ישראל וארץ ישראל. 
תחת מנהיגותו רבת השנים של חברי הטוב מורטון קליין וכל הצוות הנפלא בזיהוי. הבאנו את הארגון למרכז הבמה. הכפלנו את כוחנו וקולנו האידיאולוגי נשמע היטב במסדרונות המוסדות הלאומיים. בביקורי האחרון בארצות הברית שמחתי לפגוש את הנהגת ה-ZOA. חדורת המטרה ובעלת המוטיבציה לעשות הכל למען העם שלנו. בהזדמנות זאת אני מבקש לאחל ליושב ראש החדש עורך דין דיוויד שואו בהצלחה רבה בתפקידו זה. הצלחת ה-ZOA היא הצלחת כולנו. המאבק למען אחדותה של ירושלים, למען עצירת הכוונה לפתוח בירושלים קונסוליה אמריקאית לפלסטינאים שתפגע באופן חד בריבונות של העיר שלנו. הפעילות למען ההתיישבות ביהודה ושומרון והגולן למען זכויות היהודים, גאווה יהודית ולאומית, מאבק באנטישמיות, הסברה ישראלית אני גאה על שותפות ארוכת השנים עם ה-ZOA ומצפה בעזרת השם להמשך עשייה משותפת. אומרים מקצת שפחו של אדם בפניו וכולו שלא בפניו. בערב מרגש זה אני גאה להציג את חברנו היקר מר רובין מרגוליס. רובין יהודי ציוני, אקטיביסט, שרואה לנגד עיניו תמיד את הטוב למען עם ישראל ולמען ארץ ישראל, בעל מפעלי חסד לחיילים בודדים ונרתם לסייע תמיד גם בדרכים שלא תמיד, תמיד ידועות לכולנו. רובין ידידי, אין ראוי ממך לקבל את פרס ה-ZOA. אני מברך אתכם לירושלים, בירתו הנצחית של עם ישראל, בתפילה שבשנה הזאת כבר נוכל להיפגש פנים אל פנים ולהעצים את העשייה הציונית. תודה רבה לכם. Good evening to my fearless president, Mort Klein, distinguished speakers, Secretary of State Pompeo, and Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, fellow members of the board, fellow honoree Gloria Cayley, dear friends, and to all who are listening, I would like to thank Yaakov Hagoel, president of the World Zionist Organization, for the heartwarming introduction. Don't believe any of it. I graciously accept this prestigious honor on behalf of all of you. By accepting this award, I join a prestigious list of individuals who preceded me, such as Miriam Adelson, who is here this evening, Nathan Cheransky, Senator Robert Dole, Justice Arthur Goldberg, Dr. Irving Moskowitz, and a man with whom I began my involvement in politics while in college, Senator Jacob Javits, among many others. In addition to being successful people in their own right, what distinguishes them the most is their unabashed love for the Jewish people and their support of the State of Israel. In accepting this honor, I thank God for being included among them by deed and actions. A special thank you to my talented wife, who has been my enabler and confidant, and who together has been on this journey with me. She has instilled the love of Israel and the Jewish people in our family and encouraged all of us to do more. Before I begin my remarks, I would like to thank Howard Katzoff, who plays so many roles in ZOA that no one word does it justice. Their support and love of Israel and her defenders allowed us to bring the joy of Purim through the distribution of Mishloach Manot packages to tens of thousands of Israeli IDF soldiers for nearly 20 years. Thank you, thank you. As Jackie Mason famously said, Jewish holidays never come on time. They are always early or late. We are holding this event in the shadow of Hanukkah, which this year, you guessed it, came out early. Yet its spirit and message is still with us. It is the story of the few against the many, the miatim against the rabbim, And this time, we won. It is the story of the Jewish people. It is the story of spirit 
over real life challenges. It is the story of the ZOA at its beginning. Who would believe that a mayor 100 years ago, after a 2000 year exile, we would be able to carve out a nation state for the Jewish people in our ancestral homeland against the mighty Ottoman Empire. Empires come and go, but the Jewish people remain eternal. Judge Louis Brandeis, after who this magnificent award is named, believed. And so a small group of Jews under his leadership formed the Zionist Organization of America at the turn of the century to see the dream become a reality. With the help of God, two world wars, the political will of the ZOA, and the strength of a comparatively few Jews who believed in the dream, we changed reality. As a case study at Harvard, my alma mater, it would not have succeeded, but it did, and we are here today. Zio has fought consistently for the Jewish people and the state of Israel since its founding. Today, I believe we are engaged in challenges every bit as critical as those we have overcome in the past. ZOA's success has been the triumph of the few against the many. ZOA is not a politically correct organization, and its message has never wavered. As Mort famously quotes, you do not have to appease the crocodile lest you be eaten last. We do not apologize for believing the Jewish state, and we are not afraid to walk the halls of government espousing our support of Israel, our rights to Israel, given to us by God, has been reaffirmed by man in the Balfour Declaration, the San Remo Conference, and in the United Nations. The blood of tens of thousands of Jews has been spilled, fighting to ensure that the promise becomes a reality. Today, we need the ZOA more than ever to tell the true story of Israel. It is an indisputable fact that when ZOA speaks, they listen. ZOA addresses issues impacting Jews and Israel in a variety of ways across a broad spectrum of concerns, from anti-Semitism on college campuses to Jewish rights to Yehuda and Shomron, to fighting anti-Semitism in the streets of our cities and challenging those who espouse anti-Israel sentiments in Congress. It promotes pro-Israel resolutions in Congress, including funding for the Iron Dome and the Taylor Law. It has led the way in calling on Congress and the administration to not allow Iranian nuclear prol proliferation. It is a threat not only to Israel, but to America and Europe. No amount of wishful thinking will make it go away. ZOA has shown the way. Today, the issue of Jerusalem is one that ZOA addresses head on. No consulate in Israel's undivided capital. No backtracking on our sovereignty. We have the rights to an undivided Jerusalem that has been the capital of the Jewish and only the Jewish people for over 3,000 years. Would there be a Hanukkah without Jerusalem? Would, be there, would there be a temple without Jerusalem? My parents are Holocaust survivors. And like Mort, I was born in a DP camp in Germany, in Bamberg, Germany. My father and mother were liberated from concentration camps in which nearly all their former families were murdered. So too, my wife's family. My father was consumed with pride by the emergence of the State of Israel, a haven then and now for the Jewish people and a source of pride to all of us. He taught me love of Israel and even more importantly, that we must do what it takes to ensure that never again means never again. He used to tell me, if there was an Israel, there would have been no Shoah. It is a message that resonates with me until today. It should with you as well. My involvement with ZOA in Israel has a lot to do with his messaging. He would be especially proud, as I am, that my eldest grandson, Jacob, has just completed his service as a combat soldier in the Golani Brigade of the Israel Defense Forces. 
Not bad for a kid from Lawrence. Today, Israel is a vibrant, growing democracy with the most vibrant economy in the Middle East. I am happy to say that my organization, ZOA, had a part to play in the evolution of the state for nearly 100 years. And all of you who participate with us can assert the positive role you have played through your support. The cause of the Jewish people is right. Our rights come from God. And when challenged, ZOA has stood up to face them for more than 100 years. May it do so as long as it is needed. Together with the ZOA, we stand strong and through our commitment and belief, we ensure that the light which is Israel is never extinguished, but continues to illuminate the darkness forever and ever. Thank you very much. My father was an extraordinary man, the third of five children of a long line of distinguished rabbonim. His father became the chief rabbi of the Hitzing district of Vienna. My father was born in a small village, but the family moved quickly to a small town, Nicholsburg, where my father really grew up. He was a creative uh, manufacturing executive with practical common sense, highly energetic, and a strong desire to achieve. He had a good sense of humor, not only his own jokes, but also the jokes of others, especially about his bowling. Uh, for example, I can show this, I think. Um, you can see uh, one of the awards he got. I can't tell whether it was from his father or his grandfather, but the Shiamalas is sent to a tomb and his father or grandfather started the, the notion of doing it with the tune of a tikva. This must have been done shortly after the 1897 um, uh, Zionist conference, which adopted um, the tikva as their theme song. He was generous to many uh, Israeli and Jewish causes, including ZOA. My father had written a will and a trust naming ZOA and three other Jewish charities as beneficiaries. At this point, um, looking over my shoulders at what's going on in the world, I decided it was a good time to do this. He wants to advance the cause of Israel and Judaism. That's what he would want. ZOA seems to be the only organization around which does that. I would say that he would hope that the people would use it in a constructive way to achieve positive results for Israel and for, and for Judaism. And that he would hope that they would do so with uh, personal integrity, a real sense of responsibility and do and do it efficiently. Look, I, yes, I had the privilege of being my father's son, that's true. And when one day I have to answer to the rabbinical, to a higher court, what did you do with life? I suppose my first response would be, I chose wonderful parents. Shalom, ladies and gentlemen. Shalom, friends and fellow patriots. It is always a pleasure to be among my dear friends at the ZOA, Zionist Organization of America. But the feeling for me today is bittersweet. I'm more conscious than ever of someone who could not be with us, of someone who would have loved to have been here my late husband, my soulmate, Sheldon. For him, there was no question that supporting the ZOA was the right thing to do, the necessary thing to do. The ZOA and he were a natural match. Like Sheldon, 
the ZOA is proudly American and proud to promote the founding principles and spirit of that most deserving of U.S. allies, the State of Israel. Like Sheldon, the ZOA stands up for what it believes in, even if it means standing alone. And the exact same thing is true of our honored guest, Mike Pompeo. Service to this great United States is in Mike's DNA. He distinguished himself as a U.S. Army soldier and officer, as director of the CIA, and as President Trump's Secretary of State. And just like the biblical angel, Michael, who he is named after, he has always fought for what is right and righteous. Mike knows that the United States is strongest when it stands by its friends, and he knows it has no better friend than Israel. When free friendship is demonstrated, it draws in others. Witness how Arab countries lined up to establish relations with Israel under Mike's watch. The Abraham Accords were the first Middle East peace deal in a quarter of century and a huge boost for America's international prestige. When real friendship is demonstrated, evildoers are weakened. Witness how he runs malicious actions against Israel and elsewhere in the region and in the world were set back by the strong stance that the Trump administration took and which Mike enunciated at every opportunity. When real friendship is demonstrated, the truth shines forth. Witness how Mike worked to set the historical record straight about Israel rights to the ancient Jewish homeland, whether in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, or Golan Heights. And even out of office, he continues to speak up, to stand up, to show up for the Jewish people's right to self-determination and self-defense. That, ladies and gentlemen, is true friendship. Mike has the rare honor of having an Israeli wine named after him. It's a well-aged, full-bodied red, even if Mike himself is looking rather lean and youthful nowadays. Sheldon thought very highly of Mike. So do I, and so should anyone who cares about Israel and America, America and Israel. Like both countries, his best days are yet ahead of him. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, Dr. Adelson, for the honor, the honor of receiving this award and for that kind introduction. No one has defended Israel like the Adelsons. And while we miss Sheldon, Miriam has carried on his important work and I know she will continue to do that. Thank you so much from all of us. It's truly a privilege to speak to you all here this evening at this incredible event. Your work in support of Israel has never been more important. You should know that as was Israel just a few weeks ago, I was there speaking at a conference, continuing the work of ensuring Israel's security and participating in the opening of the Friedman Center for Peace Through Strength, established by the former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, my friend David Friedman. You know, Every time I travel to Israel, I'm always overwhelmed 
by the country and its people. I'm also reminded why it's so important that we stand with Israel. It's been more than nine months now since we in the Trump administration left office. And I, I get people saying to me, I, I bet you're glad you're out of the pressure cooker and back in private life. My honest answer, actually, no. I'd like to still be Secretary of State. There was much work to continue to do. No more important task of the Secretary of State than is standing for Israel. We know what happens when the world turns its back on Israel and her people. I worry this is happening more and more today. Never again must literally mean never again, not maybe, not with any conditions. And I'm proud. I'm proud of the record we had in standing with Israel. Tonight, I want to quickly talk about that record, and then I want to look to the future, the things that matter going forward. You know, I became the first ever Secretary of State to visit the Western Wall with an Israeli Prime Minister. It was an enormous privilege. I had the privilege, too, to visit our embassy in the eternal capital of the Jewish state, Jerusalem. We were told in the administration, you can't end the terrible Iran deal because it will make more likely that there'd be war and that Iran would obtain a nuclear weapon. But we ended our participation in that terrible deal. We applied maximum economic pressure to Iran and to its leadership. And we brought Iran to its knees. We were told you can't move the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. There'll be war. Well, we did. And there wasn't. We were told, too, that you can't secure peace between Arab nations and Israel without buying off Palestinian kleptocrats and starting World War III. Well, we did forge real peace. And there was no war. The Abraham Accords rewrote decades of failed shuttle negotiations because we were willing to go against the elites of the foreign policy establishment to secure American freedom and to champion American values. You know, we were told you can't allow Israel to have its rights in Judea and Samaria and in the Golan Heights. If you do that, there'll be war. Well, we did, and there wasn't. And ridding the world of Qasem Soleimani meant much to the security of Israel. We defended Israel, and we changed the Middle East forever. You know, like the modern state of Israel, the United States is a country born from righteous aspirations. America's forefathers expounded at great length upon the importance of ensuring the sacred freedom of heart and mind and of guaranteeing the right of citizens to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Israel, too, alone among all the countries of this region, defends the rights of its citizens from all backgrounds. These principles make our nations exceptional and will always be worth fighting for. Period. It's no wonder then that Israel and America find themselves bound together in the eyes of both our friends and of our enemies. Freedom's not free, as the saying goes, and it is only for those who are willing to bear the sometimes difficult price of preserving that freedom. U.S. support for Israel is a perfect expression of American patriotism. It's because it demonstrates our ability to recognize and defend our own democratic interests and our values with absolute moral clarity. Israel teaches us that we cannot long remain a land of the free if we don't proactively make sure to be a home of those who are patriots. I'm also aware of the role that I can play in confronting the classic anti-Semitic accusation of dual loyalty that confronts Jews around the world. In this sense, Israel is not alone, and our interests in supporting Israel are one and the same. I want to talk for just a minute about religious freedom for Christians and Jews in the Holy Land and the role that our United States government plays in that matter. The pro-Israel accomplishments we've worked so hard to achieve in recent years are coming under attack by this administration, and it's up to each and every one of us to stand up to them. Anti-Semitism is on the rise, and it's up to us to speak out against it. I believe strongly in our support for Israel because of our Judeo-Christian heritage, and I'm proud of the tough choices we made to support Israel. But I see them today being eroded relatively quickly. Consider for the moment Judea and Samaria, rightful territories of Israel. Over 80% of Judeo-Christian heritage sites lie in this small region since the time the 12 tribes settled. Now, 3,000 years ago. 
It's a narrow highland stretch where the patriarchs lived. I'm talking about cities like Bethlehem and Hebron, Jericho and Jerusalem, and so many others. Judea and Samaria is the same territory that some have in recent dec decades renamed the West Bank as part of their demand for the creation of a 23rd Arab Islamic state. This all takes place in the context of a Middle East where their Arab brothers already control more than 500 times the amount of territory as Israel. The East Bank that connects to the West Bank is the country of Jordan, a territory three times the size of Israel, 80% of whose population, self-identity, are part of the Arab bloc that officially took the name Palestinians only in 1964. You know, often when an international leader talks about Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, we hear them accuse our ally Israel of occupation and of illegal settlement. President Obama, Secretary Clinton did this repeatedly, and so has the new Biden administration. Even though these legal terms are just a casual way of calling the Jewish state of Israel a thief, in essence, they use it. In turn, we see at the United Nations, institutions, and in the media and political circles how these accusations are used to launch all manner of hostile misrepresentations and condemnations. They do this to encourage anti-Semitic boycotts against the Jewish state, to suppress religious freedom for Jews and Christians and ancestral heritage sites. And they do it to justify acts of terrorism and mass murder. But is there really any legal truth to the accusation that Israel is occupying Palestinian land? You all know the answer is absolutely not. Many nations and even past U.S. administrations label the Israelis as occupiers of the land that is rightfully theirs, justifying the murder of Jews, the rejection of our Judeo-Christian heritage, or even the denial of the right of the nation of Israel to exist. One of my priorities as Secretary of State was to set the record straight as a matter of fact and as a matter of law. And so as Secretary of State, I proudly directed to put the hurtful lie of occupation to rest within our Department of State as part of a factual, strictly factual, and legal policy stance that has become known to some as the Pompeo Doctrine. It makes clear that Israel exists within its present territory with legal title and sovereign legitimacy as a matter of international law. This includes the most important city in the history of the world, Jerusalem. And all of Jerusalem belongs to Israel and should not be divided. The bottom line is this. The bottom line is that Israel is not an occupier and the hundreds of thousands of Jews and Christians who call Judea, Samaria, and Eastern Jerusalem home have a perfectly legitimate right to live there in safety under Israeli sovereignty. But you can see this today, the Biden administration is now preparing to reverse the Pompeo Doctrine, to once again suggest somehow that the Jewish state of Israel is an illegal occupier, that Jewish and Christian heritage there is illegitimate, and to pressure Israel into territorial concessions that threaten the free access and freedom of worship of many faithful pilgrims. We can't allow that to happen. We can't allow the current administration to reverse the historic change, the historic progress we brought to the Middle East. When we stand with Israel, we're defending our own, America's Judeo-Christian heritage. It's why we must always stand with Israel. It's why we must also act to reject anti-Semitism here at home and around the world. Religious liberty is a fundamental value for our people and for our nation. And it's because, and it's because I'm a champion of religious freedom that I'm here today to tell you that the United States must stand with the Jewish people and Israel in the fight against the world's oldest bigotry, anti-Semitism. Even more alarming, I must say, is that the world's oldest bigotry has found a new expression. People will say, quote, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just anti-Zionist, end of quote. Friends, let me go on record again. Anti-Zionism is indeed anti-Semitism. We must oppose it unequivocally and we must fight it relentlessly. The nation of Israel should be admired, not attacked. Embraced, not vilified. It should be emulated, not ostracized. This is straightforward. So today, let's let us renew our commitment to putting America and Israel and our values first, because when we put them first, we prosper, and the whole world around us prospers too. There's more peace. When America leads from the front and not from behind, we are a better nation. 
I was proud to lead in the fight in the defense of Israel, the Jewish people, and the perennial cause of religious liberty. You should know I'm going to continue to do so. If we devote ourselves to this mission, if we devote ourselves to what we know is right, we will preserve that which matters most. I pray that God will continue to bless you, that God will bless Israel, and God will bless the United States of America. Thank you all. You've heard from everyone who spoke tonight about the strength, bravery, and leadership that is the ZOA. And that is why we need your support to be able to continue impacting elected officials, to change the narrative in the media, and to protect Jewish and pro-Israel students on campus. To be a partner in the ZOA's mission and make sure the hard work continues, text DONATE to 929-930-5405. Again, text the word DONATE, D-O-N-A-T-E, to 929-930-5405. It's a great honor to introduce Naftali Bennett, the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, to my friends, colleagues, and fellow members of the ZOA. The position of the Prime Minister is truly an elevated one. It brings with it the responsibility of the state, our people, and nation in the fullest range of arenas, both in our homeland and the diaspora. We are Mamlechet Kahanim, a Goy Kadosh, a spiritual people and a holy nation in the Holy Land, Israel. Mr. Prime Minister, you have showed leadership and courage throughout your career. In the IDF, as a decorated officer leading valiant military operations, as an entrepreneur who embodies the best of our startup nation, and as a political figure who has strived for unity. I was in my teens when Israel became a nation. I remember it well. It was a historic moment and a time of great pride for the Jewish people. At that moment, I felt a deep connection to the land and our people, and like so many others in the diaspora, I made a promise to support our homeland with all of my strength and ability. I have kept that promise till this day, and that is but one of the reasons that I have been so connected to Mort Klein and the ZOA. From Ben-Gurion to Bennett, you, Mr. Prime Minister, are part of the truly historic chain of leadership that continues to shoulder the responsibility for the safety and success of our people at a time when Israel's spectacular successes are truly a light unto the nation. Israel leads in the sciences, agriculture, medicine, and economic growth. Its military feats are exceptional, and the world of Torah study has been rebuilt and thrives in the Holy Land after its destruction in the Holocaust. You are also prime minister at a time of great peril. An evil entity openly calls for the annihilation of our people and state. And the good nations of the world once again choose to look away, repeat the mistakes of the past, and appease Iran. The ultimate evil now operates under a different name, with the appeasers are mostly the same. The Jewish people learned the lessons of appeasement and must never allow it to happen again. You represent our lifeblood, our biblical birthright, and our heritage. You have always understood that God, wisdom, and history guides us, and that Jerusalem is our undivided capital. The Kotel is the center of our spiritual universe and is thus not a place for political accommodation. Your providential role is one of historic proportions. It is a call to greatness. Israel stands alone, and you, as Prime Minister, face the crucible of decision-making. Prime Minister Bennett, you are not alone. The Jews of the diaspora and the generations of the Jewish people, all of our ancestors, we are all behind you. We are one family. So we urge you, Mr. Prime Minister, to fear not, to keep the faith, and to do what must be done in the eyes of God to maintain our family and security 
and our status as an or Lagoyim, a light unto the nations. Israel's promise that the Moas will not achieve nuclear capability is moral and just. No misplaced international pressure can change that fact. We are commanded, Ubracharta Bakhayim, to choose light. There is nothing more moral and just than for the Jewish people to choose light. It is in this spirit that I welcome you, Mr. Prime Minister, with a blessing. May peace be upon you, and may you go from strength to strength for the sake of our people and our homeland. Shalom, my friends, former Secretary of State, my friend Mike Pompeo, National President of ZOA, Morton Klein, Myron Zimmerman, Dr. Miriam Adelson, Dr. Bob Shulman, esteemed guests. It's a true honor to accept this award. My long and close friendship with your founders, leaders, and activists is a source of great pride. Since its founding, ZOA has been a staunch defender and supporter of the State of Israel. With remarkable moral clarity, I've seen you raise your voices countless times to point out the unjust treatment Israel receives in the international arena. I have full confidence in the State of Israel. The government I'm leading, with its wide range of diverse voices, is working hard to strengthen and improve our standing in the world. As I utter these words, Iran continues relentlessly to plot against the State of Israel and the Jewish people. The Ayatollahs sitting in Tehran foolishly think that they can sit in their cozy seats in their fancy homes and wreak havoc across the region with zero accountability. I'm here to say to them that under my leadership, Iranian aggression will be met with the full weight of Israel's force. When I became Prime Minister several months back, I assumed responsibility over an Iran that is closer to becoming a nuclear threshold state than ever before. I'm against a return to the JCPOA because it has many flaws and ultimately the benefits are much lower than the downside. We don't want to provide Iran uh, a huge backing of uh, billions and billions of dollars. But we don't need to go as far back as the JCPOA. Today, right now, Iran is in clear violation of the NPT. I urge the Americans and Europeans to take this matter to the UN Security Council to act. I call on them to double down on applying tough financial sanctions. We know that these measures work. Iran only understands force. They are much more vulnerable than they seem and displays of force greatly impact them. At the end of the day though, I have not and will not hesitate to act even alone. As in any other dictatorial oppressive regime, many of Iran's victims are their own people. While the people of Iran suffer from poverty, the IRGC are sending unimaginable amounts of money to fund their proxy terror groups in Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, and of course in Gaza and Judea and Samaria. I witnessed, as all these places rapidly became failed states, a fact directly attributable to Iran. Gaza is no different. With Hamas and Islamic Jihad destroying any hope of prosperity for the people living there. When Israel uprooted over 8,000 Israeli citizens and left Gaza in 2005, the Palestinians could have chosen to turn the enclave into Singapore. Nothing was stopping them. Yet here we are, 16 years later, with thousands and thousands of Hamas's and Islamic Jihad's rockets targeting Israeli civ civilians. I will never put my people in danger for the sake of experimenting with initiatives that are bound to fail. When the so-called moderate leaders of the PA still pay to slay, when they attempt to go after our soldiers at the ICC, our soldiers, this is simply a non-starter. One of my first acts as Prime Minister was to try and help the public health disaster in the Palestinian territories. My government, 
offered and provided the PA 700,000 vaccines, which their people desperately needed back then. Well, it should come to, as a shock to no one that the PA returned these vaccines to us and would not provide it to their people in another shameful, self-destructive act. Although I have just laid out a complex regional reality, life in Israel goes on. We've successfully defeated the Delta variant and did so without even one day of lockdown. We didn't close one business or close one school. We kept Israel going. Israel's economy is now growing at a staggering pace of 7.1%. In the first half of 2021 alone, Israel's unicorn community has grown by 24 companies. This is happening because people everywhere believe in the bright future of the Jewish state. Israelis are a resilient people. Having friends like you allows Israel to succeed in the optimal conditions and we're truly grateful to have you on our side. Just as you have our back, we have yours. Am Hanetzach lo mefached miderich aruka. The eternal people are not afraid of a long path. Thank you. Toda raba. Am Yisrael Chai. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to be your host this evening. Thank you to all of our distinguished honorees and speakers and to all of you for joining as we celebrated the tremendous accomplishments of the ZOA and those who make it all possible. Remember, your support and involvement is crucial to the ongoing success of the organization. And even though we're virtual this year, your presence is sincerely felt. Please take advantage of this incredible opportunity to double your impact today and text the word DONATE to 929-930-5405. That's D-O-N-A-T-E to 929-930-5405. Events like these renew faith in the mission and commitments of the ZOA and the organization's determination to accomplish its goals. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you soon.